is starting. You can see it. Yeah, let now me wait a bit then. Yes, it is. Now oh, it's yeah. recording. Okay, now it's recording. Okay, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, good night to everyone. Uh, so I'm <laughs> Matteo Zinoi, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Cloudwalk Research and Development Team, or <clears throat> the AI team, uh, to do a presentation and to start uh, the symposium uh, for the research, pro research projects of our interns that were made like in the last couple of months. And at first I will talk a bit about uh, how our internship program works. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit of how the symposium was structured. Okay. Uh, okay. So first of all, like the the overview of how <clears throat> our program works, it's very different, I guess, from most uh, research programs out there. No, oh, most uh, internship programs out there. <laughs> uh, so basically, on uh, the candidates for the position, like they had to. Uh, make a video, like a one minute video stating some research pro project that they wanted to pursue. Uh, and basically we, you know, we watch the videos and then we try to find like the most interesting projects or the best uh, uh, candidates out of that. So it's a really novel stuff. There's no CV checking or anything like that. Uh, and basically, so basically, uh, the idea is that uh, the participants of our internship program they they do a research pro project uh, of their choosing, and then we try to provide uh, the support for them to develop their research. And of course, like I said, since they they apply and they don't know enough about CloudWalk, so the project doesn't need to be uh, related to CloudWalk. And as you guys, I think, saw on the Slack uh, post with the projects and you guys see in the end of this presentation, you see a very uh, different set of projects. Some I think are more related to, to CloudWalk, some are don't think so that related, uh, but basically that's it. Uh, and then at the end of the research, and I think also in some uh, periodically, like, uh, you know, at the end of the year, maybe that may be a good opportunity. Uh, it's expected for the participants uh, to publish their findings at the end of the research project, but also to uh, write papers uh, with the work, the work in progress and do like a presentation uh, for all the company, like uh, today's <laughs> meeting. Uh, so just to give a quick overlook, like uh, our interns projects, they have a really diverse set of uh, fields of knowledge. So we have like some projects on natural language processing, basically text, uh, complex network analysis. We also have some works on reinforcement learning and on feature selection. Uh, so very, very, <laughs> a very basic structure of the program, I would say, uh, uh, for our, our interns is that it's divided in two main parts. So I think the first one, of course, is the research part, where first uh, we define the research problem. Of course, like they do the video, they apply for the position with some ideas, uh, but then we try to discuss like what is the best way to achieve something. Maybe we have to change a bit of the topic or something uh, like that, what is doable and what not in the time frame. Uh, but basically, after we define, uh, we better define the, their topic, uh, they go like for this part here, very, very simplified way here, but basic like study. So uh, some of our interns, they like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in machine learning, but I never study machine learning. So, you know, we spend a, you know, a month, uh, doing machine learning courses and study and learn about it. And then of course you apply uh, this knowledge, you analyze what you accomplished, and then you go back to study, wash, rinse and repeat, right? Uh, and then periodically, uh, the idea is they go like, they stop what they're doing, and they go to the present part. So basically uh, uh, we ask our interns to write what I call here a pre-paper. Uh, but basically, is it's a paper. So we have our, our template. They have to write in a set, like like an academic paper. I mean, uh, so they have to do proper citations. We also try to do some reviewing, like oh, the best way to 
to write some stuff, the best ordering, how you can uh, improve, how you present your results in a way that is uh, interesting. Uh, and with that, uh, what I call here pre-paper because it's a work in progress, but then uh, they can use that to present the current results that they accomplished so far, uh, which is today's meeting, like I said. Uh, and of course, in the end of the, the presentation, at the end of the internship program, the idea is that like the research, the project is finished, so they can uh, try to publish that on some academic journal or some conference. But of course, like here is a work in progress. So then they, after uh, today, they will, our interns will go back to the research part and then maybe some months in the future, they will, will do a, maybe a second version of the symposium. I don't know, <laughs> but basically that's how uh, the program I think is currently structured in a very, very uh, simple way. So now uh, I'm going to talk about the symposium. So uh, four works are going to be presented by our four interns. Uh, so each work, the idea is that they're going to be presented in roughly 20 minutes. So we have like the idea of maybe 15 minutes of presentation but plus five for questions. Of course, we have like uh, some variations on that, but uh, that's roughly the idea. Also not for the meeting not to get too long as well, because you know, it's, it's really, no optional meeting. Uh, so the papers uh, that uh, we cover more, they, they cover everything that they accomplished because of course the presentations in 20 minutes, they skip uh, some details. So the papers shall be available for everyone to read. I don't know when, I don't know where, but uh, the papers are finished. So I, uh, I will try to find a, a way to, uh, the best way to make uh, it available for everyone. Uh, so, and I think one thing that I think it's very important uh, to state here uh, is that uh, the symposium, uh, it covers the progress made by our interns in roughly uh, three months of work. So some interns are maybe already have some more time in Cloudwalk, some a few time, uh, like they started late. Uh, so I keep that in mind. So all the projects presented are work in progress. So really, you know, they are in starting of something, but I think uh, all of them uh, are on the way to accomplish like great results. And I think like the objectives uh, of this uh, uh, program, of this, Symposium is like, first, like, I think we need to increase our knowledge and drive innovation for future projects. You know, I think uh, it really goes with the motto of the, the research and development team, I guess, like the greatness cannot be planned. Uh, and I think also the cool aspect is because I think we can increase awareness of the cloud walk as an interesting place to work. Like we're doing different things. Like I don't think uh, uh, we have a program similar to this anywhere. I think uh, we have like big tech like Google and Facebook, they have uh, research internship programs, but the internship is for our, you know, masters and PhD level students, not undergraduates. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's very different. And also I don't think uh, many of our competitors are doing anything similar. So I think that, uh, you know, it's a cool factor, for, at least for me. <laughs> Uh, and I think the last thing I want to say is that uh, for now, this symposium is open uh, for our CloudWalk uh, employees and is being recorded. But I think like eventually, like we maybe we can open that and maybe, you know, get people more excited about CloudWalk. It's one thing, like it's a research part, but you know, it may be the start of something. Well, finally, uh, let's uh, talk a bit about the projects that are going to be presented. Uh, so our first one is by Princesa, our international intern uh, from Indonesia. She's going to present a new product development through social media based sentiment analysis by comparing word to vec and BERT word embeddings. So really like if you're interested in social media or uh, marketing or you no know, natural language processing, I think this one is a must to watch. It's very, in very interesting uh, project. 
Uh, and then later, uh, we're going to have Barbara's project. So setting up an environment simulation for accurate pointing control of CubeSats in astrophysical research. So now we go, we change the topic completely, right? So we now go to astrophysical research and setting up an environment for reinforcement learning to try to do some simulations uh, to you know control of CubeSats. So really, really interesting. Uh, and then we go to Guilherme's project complex networks and clustering applied to the analysis of the Voynich manuscript. So basically we have an unknown language, unknown script written in an unknown language. Uh, so can we try to define like applying some techniques to identify if this random book is like is a text maybe in some language or is it just completely gibberish? Or can maybe we even later identify if this unknown text has more structural sim similarity with French than with Greek? Can we do that? So I think it's really, really interesting work by Guilherme. Uh, and last but not least, we have the work of Samuel, uh, chaotic genetic bee colony, an approach using chaos theory and genetic bee algorithm for feature selection in microarray cancer classification, which is a work that I think is Surprisingly enough, given its name, I think it's the work that's more related to uh, Cloudwalker activities. And it may well be uh, the first paper published by this research uh, endeavor that we are currently having. Uh, so uh, at the end here, I want to give like credit at the start because no, now we're going to have the interns presenting, but I want to give credits for uh, the interns for all the work they accomplished so far but especially for the members of the R&D team uh, because oh, for all the support they provided because we know like some people know reinforcement learning, some people know natural language processing. Uh, so how, you know, try to build a collaborative environment so everyone can, you know, provide some support, advice work for uh, our interns and also of course for the team on uh, our projects. So I think that's it from my side. So I think we can go to the presentations. Uh, any questions? Okay, then. So I think we can go to Princesa. I will stop presenting. Um, hello, everyone. Can everyone hear um, my voice? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm Princesa, and um, I'm currently here as an intern um, at the R&D team. And I'm here to present about my project called the New Product Development, or NPD, through social media-based um, sentiment analysis by comparing Bertuvac and bird word embeddings. So before um, I get into the results and what whatever I'm doing, um, let us think for a second. What are some of the traditional ways we use to get customer feedback on our product? Well, probably some things do come into our minds when we're asked um, this question. So first, there's surveys and there's also focus group discussions, and then there's also product trials. And um, these ways are all ways that um, are still currently in use by a lot of companies until this day. But there are some things, some problems that these ways have in common. And those are, they're too slow, too time consuming, and too expensive. Just imagine if you want people to exclusively um, review your product, you would have to, first, you would have to um, find people that want to review your products, and that is very time consuming. And then the second thing is you have to pay them. You have to um, give them incentives, whether in the form of money or free products and et cetera, and that's just expensive. And then the third thing is that um, if you want people to exclusively um, review your product through product trial, you have to find a lot more people. If you want more data, you have to find a lot more people. And that's just too slow for the current um, fast-paced digital era. So then 
The solution to this is social media data. Social media data is free and it's always updated. Just as we all know, um, people post everything on social media um, from status to pictures and basically everything. Therefore, social media data comes as a solution to the traditional um, ways of um, getting feedback for, from our customers. So um, that's the overview of what I'm currently doing here for the past three months. So the goal of my project is to provide NPD, new product development suggestions for the product based on the analysis achieved through the sentiment analysis and opinion detec detection from social media data. And to achieve this, I have to um, accomplish two small um, tasks, which is the first one is to compare word to vec and bird word embeddings. Um, so I'm going to explain to all of you later what word to vec is and what bird is for sentiment analysis. And then the second thing that I would do in the future is to compare word to vec and bird word embeddings for opinion detection. So basically to detect whether there is um, a valuable opinion um, in the tweets or in the social media data we have. So first of all, um, what I'm doing, um, so I use a lot of natural language processing in my project. So what NLP um, basically is, is that we try humans we try making machines understand natural language. Natural language is just basically the language we use in day-to-day -day life. So Portuguese, um, English, um, those are examples of natural language. But the thing is, machines, um, they cannot understand text data, like raw, raw text data. Therefore, we have to um, convert text data into factors of real numbers. And the process of um, converting text data into vectors of real numbers are called is called the factorization process or the word embeddings process. Um, there are a lot of word embedding techniques, but in this in this study, um, I mostly compare two word embedding techniques, which is word to vec, which is the traditional word embedding technique, and BERT, which is the more modern word embedding technique. So. Um, um, so the main difference between word to vac and BERT that is pretty, pretty important in this study is that word to vac um, it is context, context independent. So the example of this is that the word apple. So in word to vac, apple, the fruit, and apple, the brand, would have the same factor. They would have the same um, numbers. So no difference, no difference at all. And then word to vac cannot understand um, out of vocabulary words. So for example, I have um, 1 million factors, where Tuvac couldn't really understand um, factors outside of that 1 million factors. This is very different for BERT, which is the modern way of getting um, numbers, of getting factors. BERT is context dependent. So um, in contrast to word to vac, the word apple, apple the fruit, and apple the brand would have different factors. Like apple the fruit would have factors that are closer to um, mangoes or oranges or grapes. Meanwhile, apple the brand would have factors that are closer to um, Samsung or Microsoft and other technology stuff. And then BERT also understands out of vocabulary words. So it's not limited to only the corpus, um, the words that are in the vocabulary. So um, get, getting into the experiment. Um, so I used this data set of 14,640 English tweets about six US airlines. And I took it from Twitter, um, obviously, because it's tweets. And then um, the data set is pretty imbalanced um, with negative tweets having um, the, the most tweets um, with 62.69%. And then neutral tweets comes next with 21.16%. And then positive tweets comes last with 16.14%. And here you can see the sample of the data set. So here you can see the sentiment. Um, the, first tech, uh, the first tweet, you have um, a neutral tweet sentiments neutral and the text being at Virgin America, what Debron said, which probably um, you can see didn't really tell us anything and that's why it's pretty neutral. And then um, you can see um, the last tweet, you have the negative 
tweet. And the text calls, um, Frigid America is really aggressive to blast obnoxious entertainment um, in your guest faces. Um, they have little recourse, which is definitely ne negative. And then um, let's just go straight into the results. So for the results, um, um, for the sentiment analysis, BERT is generally better. You can see here by um, the accuracy and the F1 score for BERT is higher than where to vac which means that um, BERT is generally better. But if you see in the second table um, in the left side, um, it's pretty interesting how the breakdown for each sentiment is pretty different. So uh, where to vac is actually better um, as better or even slightly better than BERT in recognizing negative tweets. Um, my assumption on this is probably because where to vac needs a lot more data to perform um, as good. And this is um, supported by the fact that where to vac couldn't really understand um, words outside of the corpus, um, which is why where to vac um, performs good when there's a lot of data, but when there's um, like not a lot of data, it would perform pretty poorly. And then you can see um, in, um, that happens in the positive and the neutral tweets where BERT is far better than where to vac in this case. Because if you see here in the data set, um, negative tweets um, have a lot of tweets, but then neutral and positive tweets are um, pretty low in the sense of the distribution of the tweets. So that's why here um, BERT is a lot better in recognizing positive and neutral tweets. But the fact here that we should note is that both word to vec and BERT couldn't really understand um, neutral tweets that well. And this would, um, my assumption, this would um, impact the opinion detection in the future, since usually um, neutral tweets, they don't really have valuable opinions for the product development process. So if word to vec and BERT couldn't really understand um, neutral tweets that well, that would be probably be a problem, but we'll see later in the future. But my assumption is that because neutral tweets in general, um, they don't have specific characteristics. Um, so ne negative tweets, um, they have characteristics as in um, negative words or just hate, hate words but and positive they have um, words that are really positive, like good and great, but neutral tweets in general, it's pretty hard for us to even detect neutral tweets. So that's why it's, um, that's why we're too vague and BERT couldn't really understand them well, but still BERT here is pretty good in detecting neutral tweets compared to where to vac. So here you can see the distribution. distribution. This is just like, this one, but it's more um, detailed, so pretty much the same. And so from all of that, the conclusion um, for my experiment is that for sentiment analysis, BERT is generally better, and this is expected since BERT is context dependent and it's more modern. But where to vac interestingly performed as better as BERT in detecting negative tweets. And my assumption on this is because where to vac works on um, OOV. And then the third thing, um, which is the last conclusion, is that both BERT and where to vac encounter difficulties in detecting neutral tweets. And the assumption of this is that it would probably affect opinion detection in tweets in the future. And so the future work that I would do um, definitely the first thing that I would do is to do the opinion detection test, which is to detect whether there is um, a valuable opinion inside the tweets that would help um, improve the, the product. And the second thing is to make a multitask model that would be able to do both the sentiment analysis and the opinion detection test simultaneously at the same time. And then the third thing is to give feedback to the product, which is in this case is the six US airlines. Thanks guys for listening. So any questions? Okay. No, so I yeah, I do, I do. If the one the one has questions, I do have questions. Right, I had some connectivity issues here, but uh 
So, uh, Priscilla, if you can tell us uh, what would be the, the next steps of your research or like uh, what do you, where, where do you want to go from here? Um, yeah, so um, I've been doing only the sentiment analysis um, for, uh, for these past three months. And definitely the next step is to do the opinion detection where I, um, it could, I, I would um, test if I could detect um, the valuable opinions in the tweets for um, product development. And then after that, compile all of that into um, valuable um, opinions for the product being tested, which is in this case, US Airlines. Awesome. Um, and uh, like for opinion detection, uh, do, you, do you have you researched like what kind of um, um, is not is BERT the word for this or something else? I don't think so, correct? Yeah, I still were to vag and BERT. Oh, okay. I think Ali has a question. Ali, just, just shout out. Yeah, sure. So good, nice presentation, uh, Princessa. So my question is like uh, more, I was analyzing the, the, the confusion matrix you show, and I noticed that the, it, like for, for instance, for negative uh, sentiment analysis, like it seemed that it, it was making mistakes on both positives and neutral uh, evaluations. It didn't seem like to be prioritizing one when doing the mistakes, you know? So my question is like, have you checked the, did a, an error analysis to see what type of mistakes they were doing individually? Because uh, sometimes uh, one thing that happens a lot is when you use swear words or to emphasize a sentiment and, and that sometimes confuses the model. He thinks it's like a bad, bad sentiment, but it was actually like for emphasizing, that's a common mistake when uh, doing sentiment analysis. I, I was wondering why the models were doing their mistakes. Have you checked that or do you plan to check that eventually? Yeah, I'm planning to check that. I haven't had time to do the error analysis, but yeah, definitely planning to do that. Okay, nice. Looking forward to see it. Uh, I do think that irony will be something hard for the model to understand. I think that, that maybe you're going to see a lot of irony misclassified. And can you just go back and tell us what is the size of the, 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 the data set? How many tweets? Uh, there were, there are 14,640 tweets, English tweets In about US was, airlines. Okay. This was a Kaggle data set like, uh, yeah, Kaggle data set. Oh, okay. Yeah, classifying 14,000 is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah interesting. Thank I'm you, everyone. Trying... Oh. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Princesa. Any other questions for Princesa? No, I think like uh, my yes. question, it's not really a question, but I think like it's really a work that can we can try to fit on Cloud Rock, right? Because we have social media data, maybe we can, you know, eventually try that on our social media and try to find like stuff that are is bad or also stuff that you know can do NPD with the data. I think it's a project that's really can be applied to cloud work, right? Yeah, the, the the issue like the initial issue is like classifying a lot of yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. It would be possible to apply for a key for sure. But as we're talking, like the main issue is in classifying, uh, looking at uh, looking at thousands of uh, comments and manually, humanly classifying them. Uh, I don't know. As I said, they they for this project she used fourteen thousand. I, I do believe it takes uh, a lot of hours to do this. Uh, yes, but Laos we can do the labeling and then with the labeling we try to 
do a model and they apply this model right. to income and data, right? That's so <clears throat> there are some ideas that we can do, but of course we need to, we do need to uh, label some data. <laughs> yeah. But and yeah, for, good. Oh, sorry. No, just uh, saying that like, for this case, like detecting positive and negative sentiments, I think that it wouldn't be as hard as uh, the other work with labeling that we were doing. We could even use like third parties, you know, to label. Yeah, yes. that's true. We could use third party. We can use Mechanical Turk. Um, and it should be... Yeah, it's not classified data, it's open data. So yeah, of course, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Okay, I think so. We can move on to the next presentation. Yes. So, Barbara. Hey, I'll share my screen a second. Okay, everyone seeing it? Yeah. Yes, I think. Yeah, now, yes. <laughs> okay, so, hey guys, my name is Barbara. I'm also in this internship, and my project, uh, the, the main point of it is about reinforcement learning using CubeSats for astrophysical research. Currently, what I'm doing, and which is the focus of this presentation, is setting up the, the environment for running the reinforcement learning algorithm. This is the most crucial part because if you have the right simulation, you can have the best results. Uh, before I go specifically into my project, I will just give a background of uh, the components and uh, so we can have a better understanding of it. So uh, just a general approach to this, uh, CubeSats are a, a type of satellites. They are nano satellites, so they are one of the smallest uh, and they're very, very small. So what makes them very special is that they uh, have a lot of standards and so standards components and standard units. This makes easier makes it easier to, to produce them because we don't have to produce specific parts just for specific research. And also it's cheaper to launch because they, they have a standard uh, size. So they, they have um, specific models in either space stations or uh, in rockets, so they can be deployed. So uh, the standard unit, it's a one unit, which is 10 centimeters cubed. So they are very, very small. And they are used for many different things. So communication, all types of research, remote sensoring, everything. Uh, their using research is uh, a very important one because they are cheaper. So we can send research to space uh, without paying too much. Specifically in astrophysical research, their use is still being explored. So the first CubeSat that was used for astrophysical research was launched, was launched in 2017. It was called Asteria. So it's very recent. And their use in astrophysical research can be for different types of experiments. So what my project focuses on is the ones that take photometry measurements of stars. So it's basically uh, watching the brightness of the star over time to see if there are any variances. So if the brightness changes, probably means that there are exoplanets or other objects in orbit. Uh, and the, their use for this uh, plates uh, 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 in Pascal because they have to be very good in controlling their attitude control and their pointing. So if they are pointing to a star and watching their brightness, uh, they have to be very precise in doing that because if they are not any variation that uh, they cause in the data because it's unbalanced can be mistaken for, let's say, an exoplanet. So there, there are systems that are used for the control of their attitude. They have to be very, very precise. So the main subsystem of a, of a CubeSat that we're going, that I'm going to explore in this project is the ADCS or the Attitude uh, Determination and Control System, which basically, basically controls the attitude of the satellite, satellite while it's in orbit. And one of the main components of this uh, system is the reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are, uh, they are momentum exchanging devices. So this is how they control the, the movement of the CubeSat while in orbit. And they are one of the most precise, but they still have some imbalances. And these are the imbalances that cause problem when using CubeSats for astrophysics. So a little bit more on the pointing control. In the image, we have the Asteria, which is the CubeSat that was the first using uh, astrophysical research, as I said. 
a series done for arc second space telescope enabling research in astrophysics so it's a very big name but it basically tells tells us how um, huge this was for the field because it was the first and it was the first to be launched for this purpose so it was only launched to test the feasibility of using cubesats for that and it ended up being the the first cubesat to detect an exoplanet so it was very successful in what it did so the way Asteria did to have an accurate plotting control to focus on the stars was using a two-stage approach for that. So the main attitude control subsystem so uh, had a, like a, a coarse control of the pointing. So just the reaction wheels and the movement of the satellite first focus on the star, and that uh, caused a jiggle in the data because uh, this subsystem isn't very precise. And then we had the second stage, which corrected the deviations of the of the, the, the value, so uh, x second or pixel deviation that where, where the star should be and where it end up being. Um, so in the next uh, presentation, we can have a better uh, look at how that worked. So as I said, the first stage, which was not very precise, was the general attitude control. It focuses on the star. And then the second uh, stage uh, corrected the deviation that the first stage left behind. So where the image uh, of the star should be and where it end up being. And this happened uh, with an algorithm that, as I said, calculated the deviations. So it used uh, a star tracker to do that, to see where the star was and where it was supposed to be. So this deviation had to be recalculated at every movement the satellite made to focus on the star. So it was efficient, but this is uh, where my uh, project will, will be in the second stage. And in the next, uh, Slide, we have a better look at how efficient it was using the second stage uh, to have a better control. So the first image is the position of the star uh, in the sensor just with the course control, so just with the first stage, just the reaction wheels. And even it's even though it's precise, like we have like a medium deviation of three pixels, it's still not precise enough for uh, astrophysical measurements, especially photometry. So the second stage made a very good job in that. So the second stage is where the, the satellite corrected pixel deviations using another component, which in this case was a piezo stage, and it was very precise. So, uh, but we can still explore different ways of doing that, especially if we can improve the fact that the satellite has to recalculate the deviations and the corrections to be made at every movement. So this is something that could be done with reinforcement learning, which is the main focus on my project. So as I said, this project focuses on uh, the second stage of the, the pointing control. So after the general attitude control already focused on the star, so the second stage had, has to correct it. And currently what I'm doing is uh, setting up the environment to test uh, the feasibility of using reinforcement for that. And setting up the environment is one of the most important parts of it because uh, some questions uh, come up, like how will I uh, consider the first stage of the attitude control to account for that in the second stage and make the corrections? Or like maybe I should simulate the first stage or just not. So there are a lot of things that should be taken in consideration. And I'll talk about how I did my project, uh, my environment later on. Just uh, before that, I'll just a uh, general review of reinforcement. So, Reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning, and it's uh, about the interaction of an agent and the environment. And uh, the goal of this, of the agent, is to accumulate rewards. And this reward would tell us if the action is good for the goal or not. So a good example of that would be like uh, when you teach a dog uh, like how to do some, some tricks, and you give them like something to, to eat to reinforce that behavior. So it's generally that. Uh, the agent, in my case, for my environment, is the CubeSat itself, which uh, I accounted just for the second stage. So I just considered the sensor of the imager. And the environment is uh, the space itself with the deviations of the first stage. And we have the actions, which in my case, I use discrete. So just right, left, up, and down with a displacement of five pixels. And then we have a reward every time the, the pointing is aligned with the start. To do that, to use reinforcement, I use A2C, 
which is an algorithm. So HEC stands for Advantage Actor Critic. And differently from other alg algorithms for reinforcement learning, it combines two networks. So one is the actor network and the other is the critic network. The critic network is basically a network that judges the action of the actor network. So not only we calculate the action, but also how good the action will be for the environment. The TD error uh, stands for temper different, different, difference error. So that's basically how this algorithm knows how good an action will be before it takes it. And uh, so it chooses an action in every time step, and then the critic network judges that action. So about the environment that I did, the agent, like I said before, is the sensor itself, since I'm only accounting for the second stage of planning control. And the first stage, the way I represented it initially, is just by uh, a difference, a deviation of the pixel. So there isn't actually any, let's say, imbalances with like torque or maybe some some other things that could be considered uh, like a physical values, like the control theory. I didn't do that. I just considered the deviations uh, to use the deviations so we can learn what correction it should do uh, according to the deviations. And this is what initially I did, but in future I will change this. And the, the, this deviation, this first stage the difference is uh, uh, done by a difference in the spawning of the star and the pointing. So the pointing spawns uh, in a range of five pixels away from where the star itself is, which is a little, just two pixels more of what the, the first stage of this theory cube set that I showed before I did. But it's already a good pointing uh, to be considered. And then the agent has to take actions to correct for this, this, uh, this deviation. So as I said, there are discrete actions. So up, down, left, and right, and the displacement of this action is just four pixels. So this is a better representation of the environment with the H2C algorithm. So we have the actor network and the critic network and the environment takes actions and then the critic uh, evaluates his actions um, in a different network. And next, I'll show how the environment renders. So it's a, it's a little bit different from what we imagined, but is that's it. So this is the environment before the training. So it hasn't learned anything yet. It's just taking uh, random steps. So behind the star, we have the pointing. It's a random image to represent it. And as I said, it spawns uh, with a range of five pixels away from the from the mean of the star. And then it has to take actions to perfectly align with the star. So perfectly align, like literally one pixel to one pixel. That's the only way you will get the reward. Uh, so this is the environment taking random actions. And after the training, the environment learns how to, the agent learn how to go for their star very quickly. So I had to slow down this uh, after training rendering because it did this pretty quickly. Every time I render, it already moved to the star. Generally, usually it use like two actions to perfectly focus on the star. In this case, um, we can see it moving behind the star after it has taken the first action. But I, even, even slowing down, I wasn't able to capture that. But it learned well how to perfectly align with the star using those actions. And uh, with, the, with the algorithm that I use, so we had a good result. And even though it's slowed down here, it does this pretty, pretty quickly every time I render it or I run the environment. So it's a, it's a good result. And uh, in the future, as I said, I plan to modulate the first stage better. So using the dynamical behavior and uh, concepts of control theory. And also uh, consider, uh, for example, not discrete action spaces because that would be a better approach because the cube set doesn't like just go right, left, and up and down. And um, just consider other parameters for the first stage, like the sensor inertia and the friction, which is which goes in the control theory thing that I just said. So yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for your attention. And... Uh, questions, anyone for Barbara? Yeah, I have. First, congrats on the work. 
uh, setting up a reinforcement learning environment is no easy task, <laughs> mainly if that's the first time you're doing it. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, since we've talked, uh, we wanted to, to do this uh, dynamic environment, like uh, really simulating the the places where the the cubesat can see at each time step instead of giving it the whole picture uh have you been able to do this and also on the reward part uh how is it working currently and and another thing uh, how 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 long did it take to train the the reinforcement learning algorithm okay so uh, the last question first the other, as I can remember, I think it was 500 time steps. So we could do that, that behavior, like a, not much. So it's, it's a more simple environment. So it wasn't really uh, that much. Uh, about the thing we talk, uh, I did uh, the thing about moving through the, the array of the pointing and moving the environment, the canvas, right? So I, I did that, it kind of worked, but it wasn't rendering the way it was before, and I wasn't being able to to run correctly, so I'm still working on that. And since I had to present it, I kind of let that uh, decide, but just but I'll go more on that later too. Uh, and uh, what was the second question again? Sorry. It was about the the reward that you're using. Yes. Yeah, Is so it like a multi multi factor reward or? Yeah, it's still the same uh, like model that you've seen. So every time step has a one reward, but if it's aligned, it's a ten point reward. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I see. Okay. Very cool. Congrats. Thank you a lot. <laughs> I think just out of context here, like it would be nice if you can. Tell a little bit how, like, because you started doing this research on physical um, hardware, and then we, we switched it to to digital, um, um, like, okay, we can test more stuff with digital. Maybe just for the people here, here, like a little bit, how was this transition? And what was the challenges you faced it with hardware? Yeah, so... Uh, the, the way I, I had this idea for this project is because of the Brazilian Satellite Olympiad. Uh, my team, we made a, a CubeSat project that was related to astrophysical research. And we got the, the CubeSat kit, which is like comes with all the components so we can make it like it's educational. So it's not actually like good for being launched, but it's good enough to learn. And this is how the idea came. So uh, when I started this internship, I well, was trying to actually implement that on the components that I had. So I was using an S32 and a servo motor to control the, the camera, which was, I was using an actual camera, not like a, a photometry sensor or anything. And uh, so I, I did like the basic things, uh, like uh, pointing the camera to a circle and all. But that I wasn't like, when the time for reinforcement came, like a lot of problems came up, like with uh, the S32 being like too slow, the camera quality wasn't good enough to 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 have good values for that. Also, since it's hardware, there were like some random mistakes that I don't even understand by this point. So, uh, I started using the the actual hardware and trying to use a camera and focus a camera using reinforcement. Uh, but that wasn't very very. I think it wasn't a good choice to start with that because it's slow and uh, it's not very applicable to other things so we changed to environment simulation it's way better now so yeah awesome uh any other questions anyone for barbara just one more question like about the simulating the the the, the effects that we will have like on the cube set when it's moving and trying to focus like i mean the the non-planned effects right did you went a little bit forward on this uh, like do you know where to start now from now on yeah i i was kind of confused with this how, how to formulate this 
this like this problem. I talked to Fabio, he really uh, helped since he like he's from this field and all. Uh, right now, I think since I did this with the second stage, only considering the deviations, I think I already have like good results to try to modulate a better first stage to have correct values of the 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 errors that the CubeSat has in this added to control. So the way I think of doing it right now is um, like modulate a simple orbit in which the satellite uh, could have a, a range of positions to to variate and not just have like the deviations or just a number that it has to correct, but uh, generating the deviations through the orbit. Uh, so that, that happens like in the actual CubeSat it has to, it has like some, some some actions that repeat itself since it focuses on the same stars every orbit. So if you were able to simulate that in the first stage, I think we would have a, a value that we could use reinforcement on, not just the, the deviation value. So I'm not sure if that was very clear, but that's it. All right, thank you, very cool. Uh, okay, I think we can go to the yes. next. Guilherme. Hello, everyone. Um, just a moment. OK. OK, can you guys see my screen? Wait a minute. Um, okay, I, I, I can. Okay. Um, so I'll show you guys a little bit about the work that I've been doing here at Cloudwalk for the last few months. And uh, my project is called Complex Networks and Clustering Applied to the Analysis of the Voynich Manuscript. And I'll tell you guys what these things mean in a minute. But uh, first things first, let's start with the Voynich. So the Voynich is a mysterious book from the Middle Ages. And I call it mysterious because to this day, we're still unable to uh, read the book. Uh, it has an unknown script. So hopefully you guys can see uh, the, the image well enough. Uh, it's a page taken from the book. And um, it has a unique set of characters. What? Sorry? OK, so um, it has this unique set of characters. And we are still able to decipher them. So we can uh, know the contents of the book. Um, there is even this debate about the book being a cipher text versus a constructed language. So a ciphertext would basically mean that the book was first written in a natural language, like English, for example, and then it was ciphered, which is uh, basically a form of encryption. And the constructed language would mean that the book is uh, just a, a sequence of uh, random symbols that the author uh, wrote down. And it's basically a fake language that uh, doesn't really mean anything and doesn't have any real structure. So here we have the, the script that's used in the book. This is the, the alphabet. And as you guys can see, it's a very unique set of symbols. Um, we don't find those anywhere else. And so our objectives. Uh, the goal with this project is try to answer uh, these two questions. The first one is, is the Voynich compatible with natural language? So we want to test out those hypotheses. Um, uh, if the Voynich was written in a natural language and then uh, encrypted uh, versus it being just completely fabricated language. And the second question that we have is, which natural language could the Voynich have been written in? So. Uh, given that it is compatible with natural language, then uh, what languages are closest to it? So uh, basically, we're trying to find out uh, candidate languages 
uh, that it could have been written in originally before it being uh, ciphered. So how we do uh, these things, how we go about this process? Well, we basically compare the Voynich with uh, different books. So for our first question, we compare, uh, we do a comparison with random shuffled texts. So we take texts and we uh, shuffle the words around in order to get rid of any uh, structure that the language has. And uh, this text will be used to represent a constructed language. And uh, for our second question, we do a comparison with texts in each of the languages considered. So we first choose uh, a few languages that we'll be, uh, we'll be using for this comparison. And then we take books in each of these languages and we compare the Voynich with each of them and just see how, how similar or different they are. And hopefully this will give us an insight into, into possible languages uh, that the Voynich was written in. So our data set, the books that we use uh, in order to do these comparisons, we use the Bible and it's because the Bible is one of the most widely translated books in the world. So it's very easy to find uh, translations in any language that we want. And the languages that we are using at this point uh, are English, French, Italian, Greek, German, and Dutch. And we also add to our data set a randomly shuffled version of each of the books that we, uh, each of the books in the Bible that we are using. Uh, these shuffled versions, as I said, are used to represent a constructed language. So now that we have our data set, we can finally start doing some interesting things. Uh, we model every book in the data set as graphs, and a graph is basically just a set of connected nodes that interact with each other. We have here an example of a graph. Uh, so a node would be an entity of our system and the edges would be the interactions between the entities. And it's a very useful way of representing systems because um, at the core of most systems, we have a graph, right? It's a, it's a very versatile um, way of modeling a complex system. And we can do this uh, for texts as well. So uh, here I, I took the first few lines of uh, the poem, Burnt Norton by T.S. Eliot, uh, just to give, us, give you guys uh, an example. Um, we have on the right the, the graph that is generated from these lines. Uh, the nodes are the words in the, in the poem and the edge between uh, nodes just mean that those words can be found next to each other in the text. So we have, for instance, time and present. And if you go here to, to the graph, we see that the node time is connected to the node present and present end uh, is next to each other in the text and the other nodes are also connected. So. We do the same process for every book in our data set. And why? Why do we do that? Well, because many measurements can be extracted from a graph and these measurements give us an insight into how is the structure of the graph, how the graph behaves. Um, we have here a couple of examples, the clustering coefficient, which just um, give us an idea of how the different nodes in the graph cluster together, if there is a lot of clustering, if there is not so much. And uh, shortest path would be just uh, the shortest path between two given nodes. So this is the, the kind of uh, measurements that we can extract from a graph. And we, we are using uh, measurements like this uh, in this process, in this analysis. So in our case, these measurements can characterize the language of the text. So every language has a certain structure uh, that's called syntax. And we are basically hoping that by taking these measurements from the graph, we are, uh, these values will represent how uh, these structures are, how 
uh, is the structuring that language that's used in the in the, the book. So we compare the values of the measurements. So when I said that we are comparing the Voynich with other books, uh, what we are actually doing is comparing the values that we get from these measurements that we extract from the graphs of each book and, and from the texts, right? So uh, now that we have all these values, we need a way to, to compare them, to see how similar or different they are. And to do this, we use a technique called hierarchical clustering. So it is a simple technique. It consists of basically two steps. Uh, we first identify the two, close, the two clusters that are closest together, and we merge them. So we keep repeating these steps until we end up with one big cluster. And this process can be represented by this structure here, uh, which is called a dendrogram. And hopefully you guys can see the, the different uh, elements being in clustered. And we can stop this process at any point. So we can choose uh, a height in this dendrogram and uh, we stop the process there and we end up with uh, all the clusters that we got and show that point. So here we have the hierarchical clustering of the books in the data set. Um, it's just uh, laid down so we can fit on the page better. But uh, we have the, the books, uh, the name of the books and the languages uh, of the books next to it. And we can see that we have basically three main clusters uh, that we got from this process. And here in this table, we can better see the results. So uh, the normal books, the non-shuffled version of the books uh, are being grouped in two clusters. And we got a, a third cluster where most of the shuffled versions are. Um, we still have a couple of outliners that um, are being grouped with the, the non-shuffled versions, but we are able to distinguish reasonably well between a shuffled book and a non-shuffled book. Uh, as you guys can see here, the Voynich was grouped together uh, with the non-shuffled books, so that would imply that it is indeed uh, compatible with natural language. Uh, so it is uh, an indicator uh, that that first hypothesis that it was first written in the natural language and then encrypted is correct. Um, we are not able to provide much insight into its possible languages yet because we were not able to get a very good distinction between the languages. Uh, we got two clusters and uh, but we are hoping to get like one cluster per language or something close to that so we can uh, do the comparison and and see uh, exactly to each language it is closer to uh, one interesting thing to notice though is that uh, languages that are closely related like english and dutch or french and italian are being clustered in the same uh, the same group in the same uh, label, and uh, that is interesting. It's it's something expected because they should have similar syntax, and so it's an indicator that this process is able to uh, give us an insight in, an insight into the syntax of these languages. So this is the, the results uh, for our main experiment, but, just, but I just wanted to show you guys a little bit about uh, an another experiment that I, I worked on in parallel that is related to this, but it's a little bit different. And it's related to stop words. So stop words are words with low semantic value. And we have here an example uh, on the right. Um, uh, the stop words in this case would be on, the, off, and, and with. And removing them is a common pre-processing step in natural language processing applications. 
And this is usually done because uh, these words are very generic and very frequent, and they're not very useful to distinguish between uh, books, between texts, right? Because you, we find them in any of them, and they're not very specific to, to uh, the meaning of the text, right? So even though it is uh, very common to remove them, it's hard to do something like this on the Voynich, because the simplest way to do this is just to go over the text and match each word against a list of predefined uh, stop words. And if it's a match, you remove that word. But we obviously don't have a predefined list of stop words for the Voynich. We don't even know what the words are. So we can't use that method. So this prompted me to look for a different way of doing this. And I ended up using something called burstness. And burstness is a measure that characterizes the distribution of occurrences of an event through time. So we have here uh, on the bottom of the page uh, two distributions. And the vertical bars just represent the occurrences of an event. And the space between the bars is the time that it takes for that event to repeat. And in a periodic distribution, uh, the time between events is the same, it's always the same, or very close to, uh, to being the same. In a bursty distribution, so a distribution with a high value of bursteness, uh, the time between events varies a lot. Um, so for stop words, stop words tend to present homogeneous distribution throughout the text. So you're expected to find a distribution that is close to the periodic one for stop words in a text. And we can use this, uh, this fact, uh, this behavior, to uh, derive a list of possible stop words based only on the text itself instead of depending on a predefined list. So uh, here I uh, grouped all the words in the second book of the Bible, uh, the Exodus, in English. And I group them based on the number of occurrences of the words and the value of bursteness. So the vertical axis, uh, we have the number of occurrences. The horizontal axis, we have the range of bursteness. And uh, the color uh, just represents the ratio of stop words uh, to total words in that grouping. So the darker the, co the color, the more uh, dense is um, the stop words in that group. And as you guys can see here, uh, we have this sweet spot here where 100% uh, of the words in the group uh, are stop words. And if we get the, the whole heat map, the whole uh, figure, we can see that there is uh, a correlation between the number of occurrences and the bursteness to stop words. So the higher the number of occurrences, we tend to have more uh, uh, higher density of stop words. And the lower the value of bursteness, we tend to have also um, a higher ratio of stop words. So this is just to illustrate that there is a correlation here and that we can uh, possibly use this in order to, to do more analysis, to um, derive a list of stop words for every book in, in any language. So conclusions. Um, complex networks are useful in our case. It provided a, a good solution for um, uh, an analysis that would be difficult. So we're very limited um, to the tools that we can use on the Voynich because we don't know uh, the meaning of the words. So complex networks or, or also graphs called graphs um, are, are a useful tool in our toolkit in this case. Uh, there's a lot of design choices to be explored. So it's a very versatile framework. We still can experiment with uh, the values of the parameters, 
the techniques that we are using, the measurements that we are extracting. So there's a lot of potential here, but there is also a lot of work to be, to be done. And about the stop words, we can use bursts to derive stop words, but again, we need to refine the values that we're using um, as parameters, as thresholds, so we can have a, a framework that is consistent and can be used in any case. So for future work, uh, the next steps, the first one is to expand the data set, so get more books in more languages, so we can have uh, better insights and about uh, the Voynich, refining the list of measurements. So we need to add measurements that are le relevant for analysis and get rid of measurements that are not being very helpful and incorporating new techniques into the framework. So um, there are a lot of possible techniques that we could add. Uh, there's work that has been done using uh, word embeddings, for example, uh, apply it to the Voynich. So it's something that we could potentially use in conjunction with what we're using right now, and this should improve our results. So that's it. Um, thank you guys for listening. Um, okay. Any questions here for 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 Guilherme? Uh, yeah, um, I, I was I was wondering about um, when you look at the Voynich, do do you know if each of those symbols correspond to letters or sim or syllables or words, and how did that affect the your choice of how you tokenize these these other reference texts? Yeah, so that's an interesting point for the Voynich because uh, it's as you said, it's it's hard to define where uh, a letter starts, where it finishes, right? Which strokes uh, represent each letter, and there are very there are many efforts that have been done uh, in this in this area. We have different transliterations, and the transliteration is basically just uh, taking the the written words, the written symbols, and creating um, a digital representation for them. And each researcher uh, has its own preferences. It chooses to do this transliteration in a certain way. Uh, the one transliter transliteration that I'm using right now uh, is one of the most uh, complete and the most, um, it's one of the last, one, last ones that have been done. And it's apparently somewhat of a standard. Um, from the papers that I've read, it's one of the most uh, used. So yeah, that there is that aspect. But um, I'm just, uh, for now, I'm just using um, like the most uh, standard one. I'm not worrying too much about that for now. I do have a question as well. Um, um, so, like, your research is going in a direction like try right, to kind of find, figure out why, where did this, if it is a language, okay, it's not random. We kind of know that apparently. Uh, and if it is not random, or well, what is it, where it derives from? Okay, so it's, it, it looks to be more similar to Greek or something like that, correct? Or, but this yeah. is this would be uh, kind of a defining finding the, the the origin of the language. But how do you see us really deciphering the language? I do believe that it's, it it is completely different uh, process. Mm, deciphering, right? Yeah. So um, I like. Deciphering it or, or providing some insight into how to start deciphering it would obviously be really great. Um, but uh, it's something that's been done and is currently being doing by like many, many incredible researchers. So I don't have many um, like pretensions about. No, I know, I know. I just want to see like, how, well, like, but, what are kind of. 
what are they doing? Like, what techniques do they use? With the, yeah, yeah. You so, grab, what else? How, how, how would, uh, what kind of technique would you do to decipher a language, an unknown language? So, yeah, um, uh, just trying to uh, get uh, an insight into the language and, and into the structure of the, the, the Voynich could help us um, like try a more specific approach to deciphering it. So the work that I, I commented about uh, using word embeddings, uh, the researchers uh, kind of trying to try to compare the embeddings that they got from the Voynich with embeddings that they got from um, from different languages, and then we can you can compare them, and if it's a match or, or close to a match, then you can more or less uh, try to like correlate uh, a specific language to a specific a specific word, sorry, to a specific word in the Voynich. You know, so it could. Uh, Give it, give us a starting point uh, to start tra trying to decipher it, right? So if you decipher a specific word, for example, then it gets much easier to decipher uh, the next ones. So it would be something like that, I think. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Other comments or questions for Guilherme? I have more of a general question. First, congrats on the work. It's very interesting, man. Vanish is always cool and mysterious. But. Hello? Joao? Uh, we cannot hear you, Jean, if you're speaking. I think he falls. I bet he uh, he's oh, down. Yeah, the problem is with, with the webcam, man. Sorry. Yeah, I knew it. Who <laughs> <laughs> I've destroyed this webcam, man. All right. Uh, no, after working with the Vanish for a while, what's your personal take on this? Like, what do you think that the Vanish was like completely invented, or do you think that? It's actually some, there is actually something there, even if it's, it is a like a fiction book. Do you think? What do you think? Mm. So that's interesting. I I was taking a look, a uh, specific look at the values themselves um, the other day, and it's interesting because the values are they are different, very different from what you get from the shuffled books, but they're also not that close to the ones that you get from the normal books, right? So I don't know. I think um, things are, are pointing to it being a uh, being a real book that was ciphered, but at the same time, there's kind of something strange there. Maybe it's just because of the content. So um, like you have a lot of repetitions uh, of the words or things like that, you know, and that could uh, influence the values. So you're using the Bible as a comparison. And so it could be uh, a much different story. But um, I don't know, I, I tend to believe that it is a ciphered manuscript, but maybe that's just because I want to. Um, but the, the research is pointing to that for now, at least. All right, very cool, man. Congrats. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. So I think we can go to the final presentation. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Guilherme. Samuel. Are you talking somehow? You're you're muted. Agora? Now? Yes. Now okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry guys. Uh 
let me just open my presenter view here. No, because, okay. And give us zoom. And the first screen. Okay, so my uh, research is about uh, a chaotic method when combined with genetic with genetic B to find the best uh, set of features on a given data set, where this data set is a microarray data set. Well, microarray data sets uh, are a data set with little data, uh, little rows, little amount of rows and amount a uh, high amount of uh, columns. So the project goals was to verify the impact of the of the uh, of adopting charity maps in genetic B colony algorithm that was proposed by Ashmala uh, and compared the chaotic B chaotic genetic B colony algorithm with the genetic B colony and ABC ABC algorithms. Uh, so first when we are working with uh, with data, we are dealing with uh, rep representations of some structure, and the representation are made are made in features. So, for example, if we have a dog, uh, we have have a dog, then we have a set of features that define that dog. Uh, but uh, when we are working with uh, with a lot of features, everything it starts to become more hard because when we have a lot of features, we have uh, a lot of characteristics char characteristics to learn. So one, one way to deal with this amount of high amount of features that we, ca we call a high dim dimensionality is to use an algorithm for feature selection. So in the feature selection process, we are trying to de de define which set of features better define that data set for a for a, um, the for some the term, some type of of, of uh, classification. So in the dog, for example, we can uh, we have a lot of of features and then we cut the, that features down trying to find well this dog is uh, he has uh, ear the uh, the little palms so this could be this type of dog or the other type of dog so when we do this type of uh, feature selection process we got uh, in the at the end a uh, relevant set of features this relevant set of features will define better uh, that classification problem that we are trying to solve. Okay, so one way to work with, with this uh, feature selection is to use evolutionary computation. And evolutionary computation is pretty simple uh, at the definition because it's based on in the evolution. So in, uh, at each uh, step of time, for, uh, we have a, a process of evolving. So we can expect that on the next uh, period of time, the solution will be better than the current solution and so on. So slowly we are, we are getting more uh, uh, better results with the evolutionary computation. And so in evolutionary computation, we have a set of terms that we have to define. Uh, well, the first one is population. There is a collection of possible solutions, right? So the population would be all this red square. Uh, the chromosome, that one possible solution is the is a row. The genotype, there, there is a gene. So it's elements contained in a chromosome and the phenotype is the value of that genotype. So, under the other than that, than that we also have uh, another other definitions. There is the operations that occur on a genetic algorithm. 
Uh, so one of them is crossover. It's when we have two chromosomes and we exchange information between the, these two chromosomes. In this case, chromosome A give to the chromosome B that the, the, his tail and the other way around also occur. And we have mutation and mutation is, uh, is kind of similar with crossover, but we don't have another chromosome. We just have one chromosome that will suffer mutation. So it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward when we compare with the, uh, when we think in, evolution, uh, in uh, evolutionary terms. So next step is we have to know about chaos theory. Well, chaos theory is kind of complex. So let's just try to make it more easy. So a chaotic behavior will occur when the initial conditions will influence the behavior of a nonlinear dynamic system. So think about a uh, dice and you roll the dice up and we have six outcomes from the dice. We have the scenario when the dice is equal to one, dice is equal to two and so on. And we have six different timelines if we, we were talking about this show the community show uh, the com community but when we are talking in chaos theory theory to apply on uh on a feature selection process we are trying to get uh some advantages so the first advantage that we want that we get from the chaos theory is the ergodicity and the ergodicity is which will ensure that the chaotic variables will pass out to all these states with a certain range without repeating and can be used to avoid falling into the local minimal solution. So that's the first advantage. The second one is the sensitivity to the initial state is the example of the dice. Roll the dice up, you have six possible uh, outcomes. And last, we have the randomness. The randomness will ensure the exploration of the solution space. Of course, we can use random to get the get the solution, but well, but the with the random we don't get these other two. So, okay, now we can talk about the chaotic genetic B colony. So first, let's talk about bees. On the chaotic genetic bee colony, we have four types of bees. We have the employer bee that will work on the collection of the food to the hive at a specific food source, and food source is the solution. Uh, we have the onlooker bees that will patrol uh, the employer bees to verify when a specific food source is not worth anymore. And we have a uh, scout bee that look for new food source locations and the queen bee that is responsible to hold the best food source lo location. So the character genetic bee have uh, the following structure. We have the pre-processing phase, uh, the representation initialization phase, the employee bee phase that we use chaos. After the employee bee phase, we can update the queen bee with the best solution. Then we go to the onlooker B phase that also have chaos. And we also can improve uh, update the queen B. And then we go to the Scout B, B phase that we also can uh, update the queen B. And then we do all these steps again, except, except for the two initial ones. So the pre-processing phase is pretty simple. We just apply a feature selection method. Uh, in this case, we are applying the MER, MER to decrease the number of features that we have in the problem. So we decrease the number of features, then we decrease the amount of data that we need to learn. So with the pre-processing phase, we use the, um, a model uh, that is the MER, MER, MER method. We apply this method on the original data set and what with this mod this method do is it takes each features and combine them and see if the asset if the or if the features that we add is redundant or they or independent or are relevant to the problem 
Uh, so we are we do these combinations and in the end we get the data set. So after the preprocessing phase, we have the representation and initialization phase. That is also pretty simple. We just uh, generate randomly uh, uh, the initial set of solutions, the initial set of popul that would be in our population, and each solution is a chromosome. So we see if each, each solution is a chromosome, the set of this chromosome is the population. So we have chromosome one, one, then two and three, and then six chromosomes. That is our initial population. After the representation and initialization phase, we go to the employer B phase. And the employer B phase, we will select, uh, we will we, we iterate over all these chromosomes. And for, for each chromosome, we select, and then the other chromosome will become the neighbor, neighbors from that chromosome. So, what, what we we're going to do, gonna do is we take this chromosome and one neighbor, right? And then we select the neighbor. After select the neighbor, we will take the chromosome selected and the neighbor, and we will we'll pass on the chaos function. After we pass on the chaos function, we will get an output that it will be a new chromosome, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to do with this new chromosome, you have to Evaluate, evaluate the score, and if the score is it's better, it's it's worse than the current one, then we will we'll increment the fail, fail counter. The fail counter it's pretty important. You see why later, and then if it's better than the current one, we will update the food source for this chromosome, not for the queen bee, for this chromosome. And then after this phase, we go to the unlook B phase. That has our, the same idea as the employee B phase, but on this phase, we, we're going to apply the crossover function. So we have a queen B, right? The queen B is this uh, that we get from this chaotic function. So we this this value he become the best food source on the population. Then we get this queen bee and another chromosome, and we have a cross, uh, constant that is cross, crossover threshold. And what we're gonna do, you're gonna to take the queen bee and the chromosome, we're gonna pass them on the chaos, chaos function, and we get a chaotic solution. After that, we are going to take the chaotic solution and then queen B, and we generate a list of crossover probability for each gene. gene. So we take this the queen B, the chaos solution, pass by the crossover, and we get the output. They get a new offspring. Two offspring in this case, one offspring when the queen B, the gene of the queen B is big or equal to the Crossover for the crossover threshold. So in this case, we have 0, 03, the crossover was 0, 04. So we have this set of combinations of genes. They are similar in this case, but they can be different. Most of the time, they are different. Then after the, this, we calculate the score for each offspring, and then we take the best offspring and we verify the same we do the same verification that we did earlier earlier so we can update the food source or, or with the fail counter we increase by one for this chromosome so if it's better we update the chromosome value not the queen b value the queen b value will be increment only if the this solution is the best solution on the system the last uh, phase is this called to be phase the first scout is pretty simple. When the fail counter reach a uh, uh, set of uh, a value, where we are just generate a new random solution, and then we're gonna to calculate the score. 
would update the food source for this chromosome and reset the fail counter. Uh, the, scout, the second scout, we have two variables. There is the chromosome mutation threshold and the gene mutation probability. The chromosome that define if you, we can have a mutation chromosome and the gene mutation, uh, the mutation on, on the gene. So we verify if the mutation ch chance of the chromosome is bigger than the, it's lower than the chromosome mutation threshold. And if it is, we go to the mutation. And in the mutation, we verify if the, for each gene, if the list of mutation probability, it's lower than the gene mutation probability. And if it is, we do the mutation. Then we calculate the score and verify, do the same uh, verification that we did for the, early, for the other steps. So the results, uh, we test with a lot of data sets, uh, but for this presentation, we will just show two of them. There's the leukemia and the colon data set. For the leukemia data set, we have the best results with only three genes. Uh, when the other methods to reach a hundred percent, they need five genes and the ABC don't even reach the 100%. Also, with two genes, we have uh, a mean that is better than the five genes of the others, uh, the other methods. On the column data set, we have, uh, we also have the best results with less genes, in this case, 10 genes, uh, but, uh, we don't reach 100 genes with the, uh, until with 20 genes, with maybe with more, we can reach it. Uh, but the column that I said, also the chaotic genetic B was better than the current method that we compared to. So conclusions, uh, we, do, we did some improvements on the algorithm. So we adopt the chaotic approach, we, also adopt the crossover operation between the negative and the queen bee, uh, the negative of the queen bee and the queen bee. Also, we include a new hyperparameter that controls the possibility of mutation occurring in the solution of the second scout bee, allowing us that allowing us the mutation that the mutation can occur without the limit uh, on the other work the mutation would only occur if the limit was reached. Uh, so final talks, we performed extensive experiments using nine data sets. Three of them were binary, six multi-class. And the result shows that the chaotic genetic B outperformed the GBC model and the ABC model for uh, and the Comida data sets uh, for all data sets that we use. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Samuel. Any questions here for Samuel? Matheus, any question? Um, oh, it's, 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 it's hard even to make questions, right? <laughs> yeah, just give me maybe some context. Oh, sorry, Aaron, please. Oh, no. oh, Samuel, first of all, very nice presentation. My just initial thinking is like, what's next with this algorithm? What's next you have thought of doing with this? How are you going to evolve it more? Uh, why did I create, why did I create this algorithm? No, no, no. It's like, what's your future plan with this algorithm? Okay. There is some modifications that I want to do. Um, I, was, uh, I want to try uh, some methods that you use on your algorithm uh, on the genetic B. I think it will, will, be, will be a nice improvement. Also, uh, I kind of want to try other chaotic, uh, chaotic functions. I just use logistic map to see if I can improve the results. 
And there is other thing I want to, because the initial population is created randomly and I don't like that. So I kind of want to try to find another way to create the, sorry, my, my cell phone is, okay. I want to, Try. I want to find another way to generate the initial population, because if you have a uh, good initial population, uh, the algorithm will converge to a better solution faster. So that's is my next step. Mm, nice. And, uh, Very nice. And again, giving giving some context here, like uh, this is similar to this is how we how we actually use for, for the fraud detection models that we have here at Caldlock. This is kind of how we do feature selection for those models. It's a little bit different, but it, it, it has the same evolutionary concept to it. So we simulate evolution and figure out what is the best combination of features that uh, improve the performance of our models. So uh, this is uh, pretty cool to see. Um, somewhere working and going the same line. I do think that the somehow is maybe more complex. Eventually we will need to test this on our data set. <coughs> uh, any other comments, uh, questions here? I know I think like my question is like uh, it's kind of this work is kind of, you know, it's kind of finished, right? So you're already applying to publishing, right? So I think like it's really exciting. Like it's the first thing that, uh, you know, this program is achieving, I guess, you know, like in uh, promoting CloudWalk in this academic environment, right? So I think it's really, really, really excited for that too. Yeah. Yeah, and also maybe uh, somewhere else from the first batch uh, of interns. And uh, this is uh, uh, Barbara and Guilherme, they are from the second batch. Although somehow started to do work with that be more recently, he's, he's also doing his first original project. It's uh, related to FPGAs, uh, but we ended up choosing only to present one of the, his projects. Uh, okay, if anyone else, if there is no more questions for 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 somehow, we kind of open to answer questions uh, regarding the. I don't know, but does you want to do any kind of final words? Well, I don't know. I think that's it. I kinda kind of happy with everything. Like the everyone. Uh, really, really improved the presentations. I think it was really good. Uh, and I'm really happy, you know, like 50 people watching right now. We have like peak of 64. I, I was afraid that you no, know, like no one is going to watch it. So I'm really happy with everything. So like you guys, you have any uh, questions or comments? So like you can, you guys can ask uh, on Slack. Uh, or ask now, but I, I'm really happy. So thanks, guys, also for watching. <laughs> yes, yeah, just I would like to congratulate all the interns here. Like, uh, did amazing work. Uh, really, it has been a real pleasure to see you develop uh, all the these projects uh, in the last few months. And I, I would like to say also thank you to uh, Mateus here that uh, uh, coordinated the whole thing and did an excellent, excellent work. So again, thank you, Mateus, for making this happen and organizing everything and taking care of the intern so well. No, oh, it's 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 easy when the guys are good. You know, you just let them play, right? <laughs> when you have a good team in football, you just let the cracks do the thing. You just you just sit <laughs> and watch, right? <laughs> yeah, and just adding some some. Some ideas here on the, the the internship and why it is in this format. I think that uh, I think the 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 question the the original question was okay. We do have a lot of great people in at least the the, the R and D team, uh, but how can we like we 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 do have like we when we select people for the team, 
we we do have a data scientist test we have like a lot of technical tests but one one thing that we always ask like okay what is the most important thing for anyone joining cloudwalk it was like oh people need the ability to learn uh, they need to be able to learn they, 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 need, they need to be learners and they need to be makers and they need to be uh, be able to self management and they, 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 they don't need to know I mean, if they if they can learn they don't need to know nothing about AI right they will be able to learn so kind of the idea was oh let's open a internship let's create an internship program that uh it's open there is no prerequisites the only thing that people need is a good idea and uh we will not look at curriculum we we do we won't uh, ask them for doing any kind of tests we just want like them to send a video one minute video explaining their idea on what they want to work and does not need to be related to payment or cloud block or nothing like that and a few people applied uh uh, most of the, <laughs> a lot of candidates applied, but they never submit the video. They didn't read the whole job description. So that was funny. A lot of people applied, yeah, a lot of people send the video and the, the ones that you see here are the most uh, interesting one. We have also uh, Israel that was an intern, but already like is working as a full-time employee. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the idea. Like, let's give them the opportunity to show that they can learn and they can do and they can research and they can create something very interesting. And I think this, what you guys have seen today is the result of this experiment. I, I, my perception is that we will continue to run this experiment longer, see more interesting people join. And I, I would like to say that not all of them have a background on data science or AI. Princesa is a, a economy student, correct? Uh, it's not like a, yes. she doesn't have a, a formal background on AI, and she learned most of the AI stuff here at Cloudwalk. So yeah, that's what I did. Try to find people that are real learners. Uh, you cannot really do that in a recruiting process. Like you need to give them the opportunity to show. They need to have. Maybe I think what we selected was great ideas and uh, motivated people. I think that was maybe the biggest selection that we did. I don't know. Want to add something, Matheus? Mm, no, I think you sum up uh, pretty well. Yeah. So we will be opening a new uh, internship batch at the beginning of next year. Oh, yes. Yeah, the idea is like to create a page where you, you guys will have access, everyone will have access to these presentations and to the papers they're working on. And mm -hmm. uh, um, this experiment is good. What? It's a good feature engineering algorithm. Why is featuring engineering algorithm, I think? You was talking that uh, okay by what are the that, features that we select? Yeah, <laughs> you you the you guys develop the best way of attracting. I think that motivated and self management people. So I think that this kind of experiment is one of the best. I think brighter features of the cloud walk in the area in the area and team. So at least from my side, that was as an internship uh, or as an intern that was full-time employed. So I think that this was the most impacting during my period, for example. So I think that, yeah, this, this kind of experiment <laughs> could become someday <laughs> a good risk for <laughs> Yeah, feature engineering algorithm. So I, I do like CloudWalk is a very privileged place. Yeah, if we can run this experiment, this is a very privileged space. <laughs> yeah, I, I do yeah and uh, to run this kind of stuff here. So I'm I feel very privileged to work with you guys and to be able to experiment this kind of stuff.
Yeah, and also I think like besides the internship program, I think it was pretty, it went pretty well, the symposium. I think we can, you know, make uh, future versions and maybe yeah, in the yeah. future, not only for the internship program, but also other projects from Cloudwalk. I can expand that, you know, uh, open that to the public. You know, I think it's really interesting. I think it went yeah. pretty, pretty well, surprisingly well. Yeah. Maybe for the new people, this is the first time we have this kind of symposium. And this is kind of a pretty new internship program as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely happy with the with everything. And, and I, I think that seeing different projects uh, for us that work on Cloudwalk, seeing different stuff in the perspective of, of a researcher working on Cloudwalk projects is that like, it, it, there is this collision of ideas and, and it brings new stuff, you know, like you, uh, you start thinking and from different, you, you, you it, it uh, feeds different uh, ideas and it starts having ideas. Like you think in perspective that you would never think like looking at all the projects and how can I apply this maybe to Cloudwalk problem? Is there a problem in Cloudwalk that may be similar to the solution that we are having with the CubeSats or the more nice or you know, Vornish, Vornish manuscript. Although also it would be really cool if Cloudwalk, like we, if eventually Cloudwalk uh, deciphers de Vornish, that would be an awesome uh, headlines. Payment company <laughs> deciphers Vornish manuscript. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's PR, that's PR, it's, it's, it's best. <laughs> that would be so funny. Uh, yeah. That's it. Any any question here from people outside of the team? Any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> any <laughs> comments or, or questions you want to ask? The maybe broader stuff. I don't know. Open open comments. We have five more minutes. Shima, very interesting. Complex team. First timer. Oh, Shima. thanks. Read the papers, Shima. I think reading the yeah, papers. Yeah, yeah, we will we'll provide the papers, and they are they have a better explanation, right? Because uh, all the interns were constrained on the twenty minutes. It's something that we 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 trained before. Like, oh, you're talking too much. You have to remove some parts, you know. So the the real things is are on the papers. Yes. Yeah, the papers. Yeah. Um, I think it will be insightful for sure. Nice. Colin, just go ahead. I think it was an amazing initiative to get uh, uh, this initiative like that. And uh, I think the challenge here is to see uh, which one could apply in our company as well. So which jobs we can uh, learn uh, the process and apply on Cloudwalk as well. I think it's an amazing job you did it uh, to get people to do what they want, you know? <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the dream. Let's see if, like, so pursue your dream. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that's what they say, you know? Okay, <laughs> let's see. Let's give people opportunities to pursue their dreams and let's see. If... Yeah, but I think uh, also this impulse is also opportunity, like, for people, like, outside uh, of the things, like, maybe, no, it's of course it's a bit hard, but you no, know, maybe you guys have some idea. Oh, this maybe it could be applied because I think like we work with more with some things, right? Like especially like risking. Uh, but then like other teams, I think like as we grow our team, eventually like the idea is that R and D will be uh, working together with all other Cloudwalk teams. So I think that's also the symposium is also opportunity, maybe try to find something. Of course, it's not obvious, but I think it's it's an opportunity, right? Yes, and I think that, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, the first project, uh, product development, like I'd see something that's really relatable to what we do. It could, it could eventually apply that, like checking the negative comments or the any object uh, ideas from, from all the online uh, comments uh, for Cloudwalk that would be extremely useful. Um, 
and also uh, well as it said like some well work is something that we actually already use uh but looking at projects like barbara and guilherme like it's not direct use but it's definitely like brings ideas we do a lot we did a lot of stuff with graphs in the past and having this graph analysis for text was something new but this is very interesting as well and i yeah, another issue is that uh, a lot of the work that we do with risk team is kind of uh confidential so it's uh it's uh, very sad sometimes to be working on this kind of stuff and never be able to show others it's, it, it was a very uh how can i say frustrating topic like doing such amazing stuff the teams like developing such cool models and tools and figuring out awesome stuff but you never can show you can only show like a very small group here in Crowdbox. so also doing this was great to to show at least have some give you guys some ideas of what we do here and of course we want to hear you back if you have ideas where we can apply this stuff oh yes please. Guys, reach out if you ever want to talk. Just reach out on Slack. We are very accessible. Anyone on the team? Yes, yes. And on the post about the the the, the symposium, I added the handle for the interns. If you want to talk to them direct, like uh, some questions that come out. So yes. Okay. So I think we kind of this is it, Mateus. Yeah, I think this is it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, everyone, thank you for participating uh, and have a great day. Congratulations. Bye bye, guys. <laughs> bye, guys. Thank Congrats. you. Thank you. Parar de gravar, Matheus. Eu cliquei aqui para parar de gravar, eu quero... Aqui, stop recording. Uh... Ô, Rita, se quiser ficar aí, pode falar um pouco.